What's up, everybody? It's Mark Schulman here, the drummer for Pink, and we are going to have such an amazing time. Oh, my gosh. Do you know who I have with me? Do you know who I have with me? I have Hannah Welton, who is an impressive drummer, percussionist, and even an, an even more impressive human being. You guys are in for such a treat. We're just going to talk and chat, and I got my chat screen up so we can see that your chat so we can answer your chats and hannah you want to say hi what's up everyone hey, hey. what up mark how are what's you what's up babe you got all your drums and keyboards i just have like this oh, background <laughs> no you've got let's not kid around here let's not play any games you have a a massive green screen behind you that can be anything you want it to be in a click of a button. So <laughs> yeah, don't mind true. my little, my setup here. You are rocking and rolling over. Your setup. your setup is real. It's so real. <laughs> so, you know, well, I think what we're going to start with is, you know, we were asked to give our first impressions of each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. I'm going to start with Hannah because first of all, like I had heard about her. I had just known her name. So I'm in a NAM show, you know, the music merchant show. And I hear some drumming. I'm like, who the heck is that? This is amazing. And I go around the corner, like into the, the Gretsch booth. And Hannah is just slaying it on the kid. I don't even know how we got away with it. Because normally they have all the people that are trying to the like. The decibel meters. Because they have such uh, sound restrictions. So yes. she's slaying it on the kid. I'm going, oh, great. She's killing it. And she looks amazing and she's young. And then oh, she gets man. the percussion and she's totally slaying it on the percussion. I mean, playing some serious Latin grooves. Oh, wow. And I was so blown away. Then we started talking and I thought, oh my God, she's like the nicest person on the planet. So this girl has everything. Oh. And, uh, you know, we, we stayed in touch. And then I had the amazing fortune because I'm writing a book on the power of attitude. Yes. So I, it, I happened to have interviewed Hannah less than two weeks ago, and we bonded, and I found out so many other things about what an amazing human she is, what she's doing on the planet, her ministry, her spirituality, her service, and I am so impressed with you, Hannah. You are oh, thank you. way above me on the fact that, hello, you played with Prince. Oh, my <laughs> God. Oh I mean, man, that's crazy. You can say that. I yeah. can't say that. I play with a lot of people in my day. I have not played with Prince. I can't say that. Mm. So anyway, it's your turn. So how did you hear about me? Or what was your first exposure to me? This guy. Well, first of all, thank you so much for all those kind words. Uh oh, I, I'm trying to even think back to when we actually met at NAM. That I had to have been maybe 17, just this young kid, you know, fresh out of high school or maybe even still in high school, just being exposed to all these amazing drummers, people that have, you know, in my mind at that time made it in the industry. And I was aspiring to have that big gig like you had with Pink and so many others have with their gigs. And, um, you know, my first impression of you is actually really different because I heard you speak and I met you before I ever actually heard you play. And so my first impression of you was just you as a person. It was Mark Schulman, the man, the inspiring person, the motivational speaker who really was dedicated to making an impact on people and their hearts through your attitude and, and who you are as a person, your character. And that really did make a mark on me. I remember um, you know, meeting with you and talking to you at one of the after parties when everybody's chilling at NAM, And um, it was really cool how personable you were and how encouraging you were to this young, you know, probably 17 year old girl at the time. And there's actually um, a video that I saw of you recently where you are speaking um, because, I mean, let's face it, you don't get the gigs that you've gotten by being a so-so player. You know what I mean? But what keeps you there? Your gift can take you somewhere, but what sustains you there is your character. And um, that I feel like speaks volumes sometimes, even more than our ability and our skills and our performances, our posture, our character. And so um, I guess we could go ahead and play this video really quick because I want people to hear you know, your message and what sets you apart from so many others. Listen, what we realize 
is we can't control what happens to us, but we can control our attitudes about what happened to us. And I'm very, very passionate about this because right now at any moment in your life, you can change, shift, control your attitude. And yes. the attitude is what drives your behavior. Behavior is what drives the consequences of your life. It's mm -hmm. so simple, but so powerful. Something I employ every day of my life. Attitude, behavior, consequence. Yes. Well, and that happens so to be powerful. the topic of my next book. And that's why yes. I interviewed people like you. I interviewed uh, some of the most amazing drummers on the planet. Some of the most amazing uh, actors, um, CEOs. Uh, yeah. it's, it's been such a pleasure because we're basing the book on the power of attitude, but other people's experiences, because I live my life. I, I, every breath I take, I just believe that, that your attitude is everything. Everything emulates yes. from it. Yes. And uh, also I believe in a life of service. I, I mm -hmm. finally realized, come to realize a few years back that everything I do is to be of service. Like when I'm on stage yeah. with Pink, yeah. I'm there to be in service of service to Pink, the yeah. band, the dancers, yeah. the audience, the yeah. crew, the the promoters, the yeah. everybody that's involved. Um, it really is about helping everybody else's life and making everybody else shine. Yes. And I know that you have dedicated so much of your life. You've created a shift, right? You've created a <laughs> ministry for, for God's sakes, literally. <laughs> literally. And, uh, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you have been, what's been more like recently inspiring you and what you've been doing with your husband and you got oh three kids now? Yes, three kids are so our I'll youngest. I got one. I can't even imagine having <gasps> three. Holy moly. Well, let me tell you, you, a lot of work. You're right. We've got three <laughs> kids. Um, our first child, Azaria, she's uh, four. She'll be five in July. She was actually born the year that Prince passed. And so, oh, wow. um, yeah, she's for Sovereign. Sovereign Prince, our son, is two. And he was actually born on Prince's birthday, June wow. 7th. Um, yes. And then Genesis, she's our baby. And she's going to be one, actually, in uh, just under two weeks. So on the 14th. So, uh, man, we are so blessed. And the thing about Joshua and I is that um, regardless of what we were doing, what our focus was, you know, be it through music or, you know, individual careers or the music that we were making later on together, um, the people we were meeting, all the endeavors, even though it wasn't necessarily specifically a church and a ministry to us, it was still ministry. And like you said, we've literally our whole philosophy around life is that we are here to serve others to be humble, to remain in a position where we can literally pour out of ourselves for the betterment of the people around us, for our communities, for society. And I mean, we're on the topic of ministry. So I'll just say, you know, Jesus himself said the greatest among you is a servant and that he came not to be served, but to serve others. And so we take that blueprint and that example and we just run with it in everything that we do. So even before we had a physical ministry, we were still doing ministry. And I think that's what's so great about this life and this lifestyle of servitude is that you don't have to be behind a pulpit to serve others. You don't have to be behind a pulpit to be a preacher or a minister of the gospel. You know, for Joshua and I, we know that, you know, as Christians and just people who love Jesus, no matter what we're doing, everything that we do is unto him and it's in servitude of others. And so, um, yes, after Prince passed, um, you know, we felt the call to start a ministry. And of course, we've still been creating music through this whole period as well. But uh, we started a ministry called Your Will Be Done Ministries. We started a movement called the Purple Movement, which is a social justice movement, um, really dedicated to being a bridge between the government and the people, the citizens, and uh, you know, building that bridge of communication and, and honor and transparency and accountability. And so we've got some really exciting things that we've been working on, you know, behind the scenes. And uh, we're super excited for this to launch. It's going to be a big year for us. Um, wow. We're super excited to talk more about that, you know, in the days to come. But that's just a little bit of what we've been doing um, on top of, like I said, creating music for the sync world. Um, we've been 
placing songs and licensing music for movie trailers and TV shows and movies and commercials and ads and all sorts of stuff, video games. And so a lot of what we've been doing lately has been behind the scenes intentionally because that really enables us to spend time at home, be with the kids, not be gone on the road or touring. And honestly, that set us up perfectly for when all this COVID hit because it didn't necessarily interfere with our livelihood as much as I know it did for so many others because we were already working behind the scenes, doing things digitally with our church, with our music. And so we were able to still maintain some sort of flow there. That's great. And it's interesting because we embrace so many of the same philosophies, but but express it and have different backgrounds in our belief systems. Because yeah. I'm not necessarily like a religious person but mm -hmm. I embrace every single thing that you said. So yes. strongly. drummers, listen up because, you know, drummers, we are the foundation of the group. I look at us as, to use a religious term, we're the shepherds. Yes, and I believe so that it really, it really is in our nature to nurture and to be of service. Like, you know, when you're getting on the bus, like I let everybody get on the bus before me. I always want to make sure everybody's taken care of. My philosophy is if everybody else is taken care of, I'm taken care of because yeah. I'm pretty low maintenance. And you know, <laughs> my wife's happy, my kid's happy, the band members are happy. I'm cool, man. I don't yeah. really need a lot. I just just want, you know, I find that if I can help support the people around me and the company mm -hmm. around me and the community, then I'm raising consciousness and I'm raising awareness and everybody's happy. And then we can all rock hard. And speaking yeah. of rocking hard, let's get into some drum, drum, <laughs> drummy stuff because you let's know, do it. The, drum, the drummers want to hear all that stuff too. So we got the philosophy. The yes. drummers just remember philosophy and who you are and what you believe it really dictates. And it becomes, it, it's reflected in your drumming. It's reflected yeah. in how well you do in your career, in mm -hmm. your success. There's no accident to success. And so yeah. listen to these so, oh you, gosh, might, you might go, crazy. oh, it's just philosophy. But trust me, it really applies to your drumming and applies it's rooted, to your it's, it's rooted in everything that you do. It really Heck is. Yeah. Absolutely. Really is. All right, and I'm putting you on the spot. So oh. I want to hear about your favorite, most memorable track you played on. Oh, favorite, most memorable track. OK. Or tracks, you know, whatever. Yeah, you so. Up. There's so many tracks that we recorded that never ended up getting released. So I'll keep yeah. those secret. But for Plectrum Electrum, the album that was released, um, man, the title track, Plectrum Electrum, uh, was so fun to record because uh, that opening riff, whether it was while we were rehearsing in the studio or we were playing it live, that opening fill. And we just went into this thrashing riff and it was an instrumental song. So it really showcased just all the musicians. And um, I love that song so much. It's super fat, a really Bonham inspired groove. And he's my all time fave. Um, and honestly, biggest inspiration throughout everything that I've studied and, and all the different genres, Bonham still really holds a special place in my heart. So that one, that groove in particular was really inspired by John Bonham and also the groove for Pretzel Body Logic um, on wow. Plectrum Electrum album was also really Bonham heavy. Uh, and I really challenged myself to write a drum uh, part from start to finish that, what, that had character you know, it, I didn't want to just have this groove, you know, that was the foundation, as you say, of the song. But I wanted it to be noticeable. I wanted it to stand out. I wanted it to be one of those things where if someone just heard the groove itself and knew Prince's music, they would know that's Pretzel Body Logic. And so, so there's awesome. literally in every section, there's a uh, even the slightest difference in the characteristic of each section of that song. So I really love Pretzel Body Logic, too. Rock in. And then for me, yes. because I I mean, most of the stuff I've done with Pink, I played on a few studio tracks that didn't make the cut. So mm. I've done four live DVDs and man, I'm just so proud. I'm so proud to be in her presence. I feel like a mere mortal oh, around her because she's not only one of the greatest singers, but she's literally doing life threatening stunts. And the band is so brilliant. Like we're like a big family. So you could literally check out 
any um, live uh, stuff that I did with Pink. But my favorite yes. studio things I did actually, and, and they're not really released, but Pete Lockett, the great Indian percussionist wrote a song called Lockett Pete. I named it uh -huh. Lockett Pete. But they asked him to write a song we could play on for my DVD. So if you go on my Vimeo cool. channel, look up YouTube, look up Lockett Pete, you can hear me playing all mm -hmm. these wild, like Indian stuff. Um, Cause he took all these Indian rhythms and it was interesting because when he sent it to me, he didn't send it to me as a piece of music. He sent it to me as groupings. So then I oh, came up wow. with drum tracks around the Indian groupings. So I love That's that. So cool. Another Indian track that I wrote on, which actually Andy Edwards, this great UK drummer, took a part of a, of a, of a uh, soundtrack from a movie Dev does, and mm -hmm. he sped it up and he put a drum track to it. And I took it and I expanded on it. So if you look up, Deb does Mark Shulman. You can hear me doing some kind of wild fusiony stuff because I really that stuff is really a lot yes. of fun because it's such a departure from uh, the studio stuff. I also I did um, I love She's a River by Simple Minds. Um, yeah. That was a new track on the Simple Minds record years ago, and I played on a bunch of foreigner stuff. I actually oh, um, we recut <laughs> everything. You, we recut most of the original foreigner songs to mm. relicense them. And I played wow. on nearly all of them, like urgent. And I want to know what love is and feels like the first time. And to play on those original tracks, oh. yeah, that was that was pretty pretty stellar. That was back in uh, 2011. Um, Epic. So t tell, all right, next because like, I have some questions we really want to hit on. So the okay. biggest, oh, road stories. Tell me a good road story. You must have some incredible, <laughs> memorable live moments, Hannah. Yeah. Okay, so memorable live moments. Um, you know what was really cool about Prince is that he was so for everyone on his team. He was a team player. He loved to, you know, bless people and give people shine of their own. I remember him even, we were all flying, I think it was on the jet at one point, and he said, you know, I don't want third eye girl to be known apart from my name. He never wanted us to actually be billed as Prince and third eye girl. He wanted us to all just be third eye girl. He said, cause we are all a part of this band. We're one unit. We are third eye girl. Um, but of course he's Prince, you know, so everyone's going to say it's Prince and third eye girl, but that's beside the point. I said that to say there was this moment in Stockholm. We were playing this outdoor show, Stockholm, Sweden. And there had to have been at least, and this was outside, I know it was at least like 10,000 people. And when you're outside and it's 10,000 people standing to sh shoulder to shoulder, that looks different than 10,000 people spread out across an arena, you know? And so it was this massive outdoor crowd. And Joshua, my husband, uh, also worked with Prince. He was a producer for Prince for his last four uh, or five studio albums. Um, and he did a lot of remixes for Prince that a lot of that weren't necessarily released, but people heard through after parties or during our um, it was like our entrance music for our shows. So people would hear it as they were coming and going, but it wasn't necessarily released for the masses. And so one of these remixes was actually of the song Fix Your Life Up, which was on the Plectrum Electrum record. And Prince had the, the sound guy play Joshua's remix over the the amplifiers and the speakers before we took the stage and it got everyone so hype. It was the first time that I had seen thousands and thousands of people from the stage jumping and singing and dancing to my husband's music, which was so awesome for me. It was just surreal. You know, we're on the road with Prince. We're playing for these massive crowds. And then my husband is also getting, you know, recognition and just, you know, being seen for how much of a genius he is in his own right. And so it was just this massive moment. And Prince was backstage watching everyone's reaction and just was so proud. You could see it in his heart you know, that he just loved this moment that we were all sharing. And he was so generous in that way. So that was just one of my favorite live moments that I came up with. 
you know, just because it really shows a lot of behind the scenes of just who Prince was. Everyone knows he was a killer musician, a killer songwriter and performer, but not a lot of people know him personally enough to know what kind of human he was. And he was just so generous. And so that was one of my favorite moments. What about you? That's awesome. I got four very, very quick ones. I'm going to go way back to okay. the beginning. My first tour I ever did way back in 1988 with Brenda Russell playing live on The Tonight Show and realizing that the moment that they said action, they were pre-recording it, but I knew that I couldn't make any mistakes. This was going out yeah. to millions of people. Now, if she made a mistake, they could stop it and redo it. But right. it was, I thought, oh my gosh, millions of people are going to see this. And I have so I just felt the weight of the responsibility. I mean, I loved it. It was a yes. high, perfect hybrid of fear and excitement all rolled into one. But just realizing, wow, I'm on the Tonight Show, and awesome. we are going live, and it was such a fascinating and intriguing and heavy, wonderful moment for me. Yes. So then, fast forward a little bit. A few years later, I went on the road with Richard Marx. Mm -hmm. And the first gig I did with Richard Marks blew me away. It was a warm-up gig for the arena tour, but we played a like a club in Santa Barbara. And this guy's fan base was like 16-year-old girls. We started <laughs> playing, and you know, ever since I like I, you know, seen the Beatles and the Beatlemania and all that, right. I had that fantasy of all the screaming girls. That fantasy came true. These girls were going nuts. And I started playing, and I was like, oh my god. God, yeah. I, when we were done, I couldn't even talk. I was like, this is crazy. I've never seen fandomanium like this. And this was just a little club and these, it, they were going crazy. So then fast forward to another experience, playing Glastonbury with Simple Minds. So we're all hanging out backstage. Now there were 225,000 people back there, right? Everybody's yeah. like going to porta potties. So I'm in a line with uh, Peter Gabriel, with all these different people, just chatting it up with them. So then we yeah. get on stage and the stage is rolling hills. You could not see the end of the stage. Yes. So I'm playing with Civil Minds, 225,000 people. I look on the side of the stage, look who's watching, Peter Gabriel, who was one of my heroes. He's one of the people I always wanted to play with. So that moment right there oh. was just absolute magic in my brain. I, I, I can't so describe cool. it to you. And then doing a gig, doing a, a festival date with Pink uh, for about 20,000 people, I think in Switzerland. And uh, we were on the bill with Robert Plant. And then looking oh, off the man. side of the stage, Robert Plant was standing next to the monitor engineer. And I'm going, Robert Plant's hand there. And he's just so digging it. And he keeps on talking to the monitor guy. And the funny thing is after we were done, the monitor guy, he was actually grumpy. He's like, Robert Plant wouldn't stop talking in my bloody ears. I couldn't even concentrate. <laughs> And then the last moment I'm going to talk about was when we finally did Wembley Stadium. Not Wembley Arena, but Wembley Stadium. A hundred yeah, yes. Two nights in a row with Pink. The last tour we did, 2019. Something about being in the stadium. And that was just sort of like one of my biggest childhood dreams. And the yeah. experience of the audience. I mean, every, every Pink audience was so un like sublime. And yes. they're all so adoring. And mm -hmm. but that was a moment. And the strange yeah. thing was the whole tour was cold. And the first night we played Wembley Arena, and these were the two nights we filmed for the live DVD. It was hot and muggy, and everybody's <laughs> melting all the girls' this makeup. Yeah. And, and behind me, I have all these flames that come up during one of the songs. Yeah. And I always feel bad for the poor camera guy standing right behind me. And I always check him every gig to make sure he's okay. This particular yeah. gig, you could smell the burning plastic on his camera. <laughs> and it was just all yeah. magical and surreal moments. So, yeah, those are some real amazing so that's amazing that actually reminded me of two things quickly i wanted to add another really cool live moment was our first performance on like late night tv or tv in general with third eye girl it was on jimmy fallon before he took over the tonight show and uh we didn't technically even have a name yet for our band and so 
Prince, that's like the crazy show where we played Bambi and we were rocking out and he did this crazy solo and then ended. And normally, you know, we wait for him to throw his guitar neck down to end the song as the cue. But he, no, he took that guitar off and threw it in the air. And the cue was us watching it to hit the ground. Ah. And then there's all this crazy feedback from the amplifiers and the guitar. And Jimmy Fallon Stop. runs over and like attempts to turn down the amp and the speakers and stuff. He's like, no, I, I got to leave it. I got to leave it because it's Prince. But that was a really epic moment that y'all, yeah. if any of you guys saw that, we did not know that was happening. It was not planned, at least as far as the girls and I knew. Maybe he knew he was going to do it. But yeah, that was an epic moment. And then speaking of fire and pyro, I the only time I ever experienced that uh, mechanism in a show was actually when we played the Billboard Awards when Prince got the Icon Awards. So first of all, I wanted to say congrats to Pink and you guys, the whole team, because I know that that's an that's a major achievement. And yeah. what a what an honor and a blessing it is to just be involved and be a part of her story i'm sure you know for oh, you yeah. because i know what that felt like to be there with prince and you know perform you know for that but the 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 fire i was so nervous and i, I even the hair and makeup the girl who was on tour with us at that time i said don't put a bunch of hairspray in my hair because yeah. i'm right there the fire <laughs> is right behind me and every time it went off it was so hot and i would just like try to peek to make sure i wasn't too far back fire. to get caught. Yeah, exactly. But it was so cool. So cool. You know so. what? We, we had a few nights where the em where there was a problem with the pyro and the embers were landing in people's hair. Nobody's hair caught on fire. But like everybody else, I had like, you know, wad, just a whole ton of hairspray. <laughs> and it was a freaky feeling. And also my symbols are every time the pyro goes off, there would be residue on my symbols. So oh, the next no. stop, I hit the symbols and I'd look away because the residue would be bouncing and be coming all off. Oh. You know, and we, I, we talk about we weren't wearing masks back then. We probably should have had Right. You know? Right, exactly. So oh, uh, man, all right, let's go on to the next one. Okay. So um oh big oops moment of your career. Oh Lord. Oops. So there were a, I can I can actually share two really quickly. The first one that came to mind was uh uh, in Portugal, we were on the road and um, I, it was right after Amsterdam. I think it might have been in 2014. It all blends together a little bit. But we were in Portugal and honestly, I haven't had, or at least up until this point, I hadn't had a lot of crazy oops moments. Like you said, you know, when you were going on TV and you knew it was pre-recorded, you had that pressure of wanting to have that perfect performance so that it, it was seamless, you know? And that's sort of how I, you know, looked at everything too for me from start to finish when it came to my playing i was in the moment i loved it but was also disciplined to really have that muscle memory to know what to hit when to hit it and just my senses i mean you know it's like your senses are on overload and so you're thinking 100 miles a minute you're performing 100 miles a minute and you're fifteen thousand steps ahead of the moment that you're currently in to make sure all the tracks are covered and so <laughs> my first big oops moment that I can remember was at this show in Portugal. It was on flipping purple rain. If you're going to mess up, let's not mess up purple <laughs> rain, okay? Yeah. Gosh, Hannah. So at the end, we're holding out this big sustained note while Prince, you know, is either singing um, and sort of and sort of living or doing it on his guitar. And we're waiting for this cue where we choke first. And then I do a broom, just a nice fill. And then we hit our last big note. And so we're holding out this sustained note. And I don't know what I was doing. He was actually on keys this time that we played. And I must have been looking at Donna or Ida or someone in the audience, you know, just like, hey, what's up? This is so cool. And I totally missed the choke. So he cues for everyone to go, ba, broom. But, and I miss it. So my fill wasn't there. My hits weren't there. Oh, Everyone no. else was hitting and I was just like in sustain <laughs> mode. And I just, I, I missed it and looked down immediately and was like, oh my gosh, don't look, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. But I could just <laughs> feel the eyes from the oh, keyboard. Wow. And so I look up 
And I was just kind of, you know, I'm sorry. And he did, he gave me one of these. He was, he was, you know, still in character, of course. And so he's on the keys and all emotional because it's purple rain. But then he looks up at me and he goes. <laughs> and Prince is infamous for docking people, just like James oh, Brown. Really? And so, oh, I yes. thought that was a joke. <laughs> no, nope, that was real. However, uh, he never, I don't believe he ever actually docked me or the girls with Third Eye Girl. I know in the past he actually, no, that was a real thing. But um, we never actually got docked, which I'm thankful for. But that moment, I I was not ready to find out. I didn't want, yeah. I didn't want that, you know, that confrontation and that conflict. So that was one big oops moment just on Purple Rain. And then the other one was when we were on the Arsenio Hall show and um, we played She's Always In My Hair, which is one of my favorite songs that we played live. And uh, our the live version was just super rocking and thrashy, but just funky at the same time. It was funk and roll, you know, and, and so just so cool. But the end everyone throughout the song everyone kind of got a, a moment to shine and to solo and so at the end we had this super breakdown where there were a bunch of hits and i would do you know crazy stuff in between all the hits but for the sake of being on arsenio we shortened it because you know on tv you don't always have that long time that you want yeah. you know like a live show so we shortened it um and man we rehearsed it rehearsed it it was good i had it we got in that moment though, <laughs> the adrenaline said, okay, everyone else is ending, but I'm gonna keep soloing because the song ended right after the solo in this new version. And so I nailed that solo, was so hype, adrenaline was going, I crashed, everyone else ended, and I went right back into that halftime groove. And I just think, luckily it wasn't a live show. It was pre-recorded. So they just edited it on that hit, you know, right after <laughs> where I just kept grooving into the abyss by myself. But, and he didn't even give me a hard time that time. I don't even think he acknowledged it, but I was so hard on myself because we had yeah. practiced it. And, you know, it just doesn't feel good when, when you feel like you drop the ball. And especially as the drummer, you know, I feel like if the drummer messes up, it's really obvious because like you said, we're sort of the shepherd of the group. We hold everything together. We keep everything in sync and locked. And so if we're off, it's noticeable, you know, super noticeable because we're also extremely loud most of the time. So those were my moments. What about you? Man, I'm inspired. To me, that last moment was just inspiration, man. You just went with went with it. You know, like, like literally the muse going through you. I had a couple quick moments. One was, you know, I played with Velvet Revolver for six weeks. He did Ozfest. I subbed for Matt Sorum when he broke his hand. Oh, so, man. You know, the first night, actually, no mistakes. I had no rehearsal with him. I had charts I was kind of looking at. And, yeah. you know, I was, just went right in. Second yeah. night, one of the songs, right, I didn't end in time. So I kept on playing. So kind of Slash looks at me and Dub looks at me and they start jamming with me and Dave, Dave Kushner. We start jamming and it's really, we're having a ball, we're jamming. And Scott Weidland, you know, Scott was really fiery. Yeah. Rest, rest in peace. Amazing. Yeah, person. yeah. But, uh, you know, a very fiery and, and temperamental man. Mm -hmm. He looked back like he was so angry, like, like, what are you guys doing? So we stopped the jam. So Scott like starts saying, I'm sorry that these Bing guys went and did this bing jam and he's really angry yelling oh, no. about us to the audience. So then we're playing the next song, right? Scott's running around the stage and he comes up and he spits on my drum set. <gasps> and no I have two thoughts way. at the time. My knee jerk reaction is I'm angry. I'm going to jump off the kit and yeah, you know, exactly. you know, right. Yeah. And, my, and then, and then the same part, you know, is like, we're not going to do that. We're just going to let it slide. Yeah. Yeah. So that was such a wild moment for me. Man, I can only because, imagine. You know, you know, I he knew it was my my for, and the the other one with Scott Weiler was so wild when they the first night when they went when they went to introduce everybody, he, you know, he introduced Slash and Dub. Yeah. And then he says, Our drummer, our brother, Matt Swarm, couldn't be with us tonight, but we got a dear friend of ours substituting for him. And he's going to tell you his name. <laughs> and he, he reaches oh, no. back to hand me the microphone. And, and my thing is like, I thought on my toes, I thought really quickly, 
heck with that. And I just like look down at the drums. I just turn bam, bam, bam. And then I play this really quick solo and I stop through my sticks in the audience. And then I grab the mic and said, I'm Mark Shulman. Cause I, thought, yes! I wanted to save the day. The other one, the other oops moment, which has happened a couple of times, you know, on the pink tour, everything's on click because everything is, is mm. synced up to Simpty. Yeah. So, you know, we've got, um, although, you know, we got the lighting people and the video people are still operating stuff, but everything's synced up. Well, yeah. You're wearing the in ears, right? You're yeah. relying on the click, right? So if your batteries go dead in your pack and all of a sudden you can't hear and all you're hearing is a three second delay inside delay. a stadium oh. of 25,000 people and I'm, and nobody knows. All of a sudden they go, I'm like, and I look at my tech and then I look at Jason, the musical director, like, ears, you know, and he's like, so what he does, he starts telegraphing the time because I can't, I don't know where the time oh is. Oh my gosh. And, you know, the irony is, you know, your, your, your body, the first natural knee jerk reaction is your body, you're going to start rushing because you're, yeah. you're rushing. and I thought to myself, the thing that I need to do is consciously hold my meter, hold my tempo the best I can. Mm -hmm. And then my, you know, I had to wait for my tech to run in, change the batteries, hook it back up. We man, and also, cause all, remember going through this, they're doing aerial stunts. The dancers, Pink, they're relying on my cues. So if I'm mm -hmm. off and I'm playing and the band, all of a sudden the whole thing's starting to fall apart, the whole thing falls apart. So oh it was God. falling apart a little bit, but I kind of got, Enough of Jason's yeah, thing yeah. Thank God for him. Enough of his telegraphing, and then the, and my my tech was so fast and just you know put the batteries oh. back in so quickly. But that was a big whoops moment. Oh my but gosh. nothing that I, you know, that I caused yeah. really. You know, that yeah, was just one of no, It's happened sure. twice on the ping tour. Okay, let's go on because oh, we want no, we no. time for some questions too. What okay. are you practicing right now? So look, right now, like we talked about earlier, I honestly took a ton of time off when I started having kids and really dove into this mom thing. And so I didn't perform as much. I honestly didn't play as much. I also, you know, right after Prince passed, I didn't play a lot either just because that was a really big time of rest and healing for me yeah, as well I as bet. becoming a new mom. Uh, but now I am honestly just diving back in with student mode, you know, wanting to just get my hands wet again to build up that endurance. I've, I've just recently started diving back in with more of a set um, time for practice and just getting alone time to be able to come down here and play. Yeah. Um, and so that's really, that's what I've been working on is coming down here, building up chops again, um, really taking it back to the basics, single strokes, double strokes, paradiddles, just rudiments to really build up my muscles and my chops. Um, but a lot of times when I come down here, I'll start by putting on some songs in the studio and just jamming along with it and having fun. I'm just in this yeah. mode of not necessarily having this plotted out agenda as much as I just am in the mode to get down here, have fun, whatever happens, happens, but just really build up that discipline in scheduling and making it happen more, you know, because I honestly feel like a, a putt all over again. You know, I feel like I'm That's diving awesome. in for the first time and it's really cool. Um, I also, I got really frustrated <laughs> last time I was down here, basically to the point of tears, because, you know, you get to this point in your career where everything is sort of coasting as far as I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you can attest to this or maybe not. But, you know, when you're working with someone like Prince or like Pink or Cher, you get into this routine and this grind yeah. that really you get used to it. You get accustomed to it. And so you're not necessarily always pushing barriers in your own playing because you've got this super dope set gig where, you know, you're performing at your top peak uh, not that you've hit a ceiling, but just, you know, you're performing great and at excellence all the time. And you're surrounded by these killer musicians. And so you're not necessarily always in student mode the same way that you were before you got those gigs, you know, where you're in the practice room and you're digging in or you're working on your reading or, you know, you're trying to tackle these new techniques and stuff like that, because you just don't always have that same time. And so now I have found myself in this place where I have that time again. And it's actually been really cool to 
see where my playing needs uh, some polishing and also see where I haven't necessarily missed a beat in these last few years and to really just analyze that. So that's where I'm at now. I'm, I'm also yeah. working on writing my own music. I just feel like I'm finally in the place where I can focus on creating my own stuff. Joshua is an excellent writer and producer and composer and just everything. But I also have a writing bug in me too. And I can play keys enough to, you know, write out some chords and structures and stuff to really put together my own situation as well. So that's kind of where I've been is writing and singing and putting together these ideas as well as polishing my my playing again and just really brainstorming you know i'm in that building process again yeah that's awesome i'm gonna be even quicker than that because i'm gonna get very specific so i go to the studio when i can now and i and i always just sit down stream of consciousness whatever i happen to be thinking at the moment i just yeah. start to play and i find myself just doing something new whenever i sit down to play that's also, so the cool. other thing that I've been working on trying to, <laughs> something I always wanted to do, you know, <laughs> here, you know, Greg Bissonette doing it and Glenn Sobel doing it, which is like um, alternating your hands and your feet, like right hand, left foot, left hand, right for the dick. Oh, dig, yeah. Dig, dig, dig. So I've been working on that, like just getting that really, really fast. That's yeah. been fun. I've been working on just swinging again, just want to get my swing, you know, down and just, totally. you know, just playing and. It, it just try to keep everything solid. And the craziest thing I'm working on lately, I, I, Jacob Collier, this guy's otherworldly. This this yes. new kid, he's like 25. So he just released something on Instagram. He's playing six with his thumb, five with his index finger, four, three, two. No. So I have taken that on. Last night, and I decided I'm going to do it every night right before I go to sleep. Just do a little bit. And I'm not anywhere near close. I was talking to Thomas Lang. You know, Thomas is like the yeah. master. We were talking about it yesterday. And Thomas was like, I said, you know, I think I'm going to start with, you know, the six and then the three and then the four and the two. He's all, man, I would start with a five over six, dude. That's the hardest part. Because I could do five right. over four. I got the uh -huh. sound up, but five over six is crazy. But you got to find Jacob Collier. It's on Instagram. Doing yes, it. I got to look that up. Oh and I'm going to try to like do it. I don't even know if I'll be able to get the five Dude. over six. Also, he's a keyboard player. So yeah. it's one thing like I could do things like with multiple limbs. Hands and feet. Fingers, yeah. I don't play keys. It's it's a freaky thing, but it's been fun to work on. That's All right, crazy. Let's go on. So, okay. Um, Hannah, what was your first Gretsch? Do you still have it? I do. I actually, um, well, my first Gretsch was the renowned Maple Kit. And uh, she was such a beauty. That, right? Yeah, we've got a picture of it. It's coming. There yes, she there she is. Oh, my gosh. So massive. Um, it's really funny to see that because I feel like it has taken so many different forms over the years. You know, I've got this is the full setup where it's three across the top. 8, 10, 12, and then 14, 16 in the toms. Uh, I believe this kit was a 20, or the kick was a 22. And then up behind me, you can see my gong drum there. That, I believe, was an 18 inch. So it's 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and then the 22 kick. Um, trash cat over there on the side, a bunch of Zildjian symbols. So yeah, that's the big setup. And she was my first Gretsch baby. And um I actually recorded Plectrum Electrum on that kit too. All the recording that I did with Prince was with my renowned Maple. And uh, just such beautiful drums, so warm, so versatile. And um, I do still have her as well. Uh, I actually have been talking to Joshua about switching out the electronic kit and bringing in the acoustic kit, which would be my 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 renowned baby. Your so baby. yeah, that was my first Gretsch kit, and I love her so much. Oh, that's so cute. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell a couple of different stories. My first, I actually had a Gretsch 10 inch tom that I added to my Slingerland drum set. When I was a teenager. So, cool. so that was my first Gretsch. Oh, man. But we don't have a photo of that. But I wanted to say two really quick stories and then we could show my the, my first actual kit. So mm -hmm. I remember doing a bunch of sessions in the 90s and I was touring so much. So instead of having a kit on, you know, ready to go, I would always ask the producer, engineer, just hire whatever kit you want. And 90% of the time I'd walk in, it would be a Gretsch kit. Mm -hmm. So I knew that the people in the studios, Producers, the engineers, the people that really know always 
always preferred Gretsch over everything, yeah. 90% of the time. Also, yeah. another famous drummer, I will not mention his name, but he has been endorsing another drum set for a long, long time, and he did a clinic, and he was talking about his drums. He goes, oh, but in the studio, of course, I use Gretsch. <laughs> well, there you I have know. it. Not so good for the band, but the honest truth. So my yeah. first Gretsch kit was when uh, it was in 2002 when I signed with Gretsch, and you want to show that kit now? It's the kit I played on the Share Tour, and I still basically play the same setup, although I've got a larger bass drum. This was um, the the USA series, 10, 12, 8, 16, 18, and then I sometimes would have a 14 on the side, and then I was using the Gibraltar rack that was uh, mm -hmm. obviously distributed by Gretsch at the time. Yes. And uh, that was a 24 by 18 inch bass drum. And then I've expanded, I kind of keep the same setup, but then I went and had a, a second bass drum with four in a ride, three bass drums. I've gone to a 26. Yes. So every time now I play a 26. 26, yes. I do bottom size now, 26 by 14. On the foreigner tour, I was doing a 26, a 24, and a 20 because Mick Jones wanted me to have the biggest visual, you know. Yeah. But the interesting thing is when I first started out on the Pink Tour, I was just playing a five piece, a new classic kit, because mm -hmm. I thought that's all I needed. And then I started building it. And as I was building it, I found use musical reason to build up this mm -hmm. big kit. And on the share yeah. kit, the reason why I had that big share kit is because I was playing share music from all these, these decades and I wanted to emulate the Hal Blaine fills. And Hal oh. Blaine had that eight drums. He had these Blamar shells, these, um, uh, fiberglass shells and yeah. later became the Octoplus from Lund uh, from Ludwig. But mm -hmm. I wanted to have at least the eight so I could do 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 so it so it would sound like a breadth of a lot of tonalities. Yeah. And so I play and I I love my renown kit. I have a five piece yes. renown kit. So I have a broadcaster kit, the new classic kit, mm -hmm. the Brooklyn kit. The USA oh, kit. Now, that USA kit actually is living at my friend's house. He keeps it in his living room. That's why it's such a beautiful photo. Um, cool. And then, so the current setup, my current setup is that exact drum set, but as the broadcaster. And I have single okay. lugs in the middle and long rods. So it looks like the student model kit. And the broadcaster, of course, is a very different configuration. It's three yeah. ply, it's maple poplar maple and i have the 26 by 14 just one bass drum and i play a um actually i play a custom painted solid maple 16 uh six and a half by 14 and then i'm mm -hmm. playing my mark shulman snare drum because for about five years i had my own signature drum with gretch that's right i remember that a six by 12 and a six by 13 and you can still buy them somewhere but uh I think I only have one left myself because I think I've given a few of them away. And that's my <laughs> basic setup now. What's your current setup? So my current setup is still basically the third eye girl setup. Um, if we want to go ahead and pull up the picture and then I can explain it. So it's this gorgeous baby. This is my USA custom. And, uh, you know, I remember when Prince was talking to me about having a kit. I already had the the red or the dark cherry renown kit that we saw. And then I also had a blue ocean sparkle uh, new classic, which I also love. It's gorgeous. Um, but he wanted to stay away from those two colors, red and blue. And he never necessarily said why, but, you know, he didn't necessarily subscribe to any sort of politic. And so I guess it could be about politics. It could even be maybe about gang colors. I don't know what it was about, but he said, we don't want red or blue on stage. We also never really wore red and blue. So it was interesting, but um, I had to get a new kit. And so as I was going through different things, different ideas, um, my dad and I had talked about this uh color scheme that we saw before in these Gretsch kits and so we reached out managed to order this gorgeous USA custom uh with the gold interlay and the gold hardware and uh he, Prince loved it he was like it's the beautiful it's the most beautiful kit we've ever seen or the prettiest kit we ever saw and um it initially was ordered with just two bass drums 
which was the 22 and then the side drum was an 18. And that was actually my current setup with my Ocean Sparkle, my new classic. It was two rack toms, two floor toms, the 22 uh, kick and then the offset 18 on the side. And um, oh yeah, beautiful. So this is the kit now. It's two up, two down, and then Prince actually wanted to add a third bass drum. So you can see the third bass drum there over on the right under the ride symbol. And honestly, I'll be honest, because I know everybody's gonna ask, no, I never actually used all three bass drums. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really more for the aesthetic because our name was Third Eye Girl and it also looked symmetrical and really cool. So um, I did, however, use the, the two, um, the 22 in the new classic and the 18. And then when we took that set up to the USA Custom, we actually ordered a 26 for the center bass drum because it's just so fat and massive, as you know, because you use a 26. I love and it. it was I love amazing, it. man. Doing sound check sound checks with that kick. There's nothing like it. Just boom, boom. It just yeah. echoes throughout the whole place. The delay in the arenas and stuff. It's just so massive. And so um that is still my current setup i don't necessarily use the three bass drums anymore i tend to just stick with the one and um the still the two up two down so it's 10 12 14 16 um and then an auxiliary snare on the side that i typically switch out um but i think my favorite one i forget what wood it is and what actual kind of snare it's still a gritch snare but it's a 12 inch and it's deep and um, it's just got a really nice crack, almost like a little piccolo snare, but it's still fatter than that, you know? So um, that is my current setup. And uh, it took me a while actually to want to use the USA Custom for something other than Third Eye Girl after Prince passed. I had a few clinics and stuff that I did and I played the Chicago show a couple years ago and I was going back and forth on what kit I wanted to use, if it should be the Renown or the new classic or the USA custom that was really only ever seen with Third Eye Girl. And I just chose to stick with it um, because it is such a beautiful kit and it represents so much for me and my career and my life. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's the USA custom. I also cool. do, sorry, have the Gretsch, the Catalina Club, little tiny jazz kit that I got when I was in college and would take when we had different like combo performances and small performances around Chicago for school, I would use my, my Catalina club. And that honestly is a kit that I recommend to beginners all the time. When people reach out to me, Hey, my kid wants to start playing drums. What should I get him? And I always tell them Gretsch Catalina club. It's perfect. It's versatile. You can use it for anything. It's sturdy. Go for it. That's awesome. I think we got a yeah. photo of my current setup as well. Do we have that? Yeah. Okay, yeah, oh, that's my current that's setup so with cool. So yeah, that's that's the broadcaster with the single lugs. You can't really see the single lugs because that's the fire, that's the flame right behind Dude. me. That 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 that, fra that frazzled my uh, cameraman's uh, camera. Oh, no. One super super quick story about gear. When I got the Velvet Revolver gig, that's the first time I ever used a twenty six. I called up a Gretsch. I said, I, "Can you? Can I, I know it's the last minute? Can you get me a kit with a twenty six? All they had was the Catalina Rock." Orange Sparkle, 26, 13, 16, 18. It was yeah. a $900 drum set. I used a hammered uh, brass, uh, Gretsch, Gretsch snared him with it. Went on the road with it. So good, the that snares everything. loved it. He loved it more than Matt's current drum set. He said, I love these drums. They hold the tuning so well. Yes. Matt is, of course, now a Gretsch guy. But that was what I used with Velvet Revolver. And I even That's had all the guys good. sign the tom. And then I gave it to uh, Alicia's husband, Carrie, for his club in Vegas. And uh, the club's gone, and I have no idea where the drum set is. Oh, but, hey, that's how it goes. So we're <laughs> wrapping up. So do we, are we taking some questions, Jules? Um, we have one good question next if you want to take it. Yes, we'd love to take it. What's the good question? Um, how do you deal with nerves when playing live, and is it different now than it was, say, earlier in your careers? Hannah, I have a lot to say about that, but Hannah, I wrote a book yeah. called Conquering Life's Stage Fright, Three Steps to Top Performance. So yeah. it's available on Amazon. I talk all about stage fright and ways of dealing with it because everybody deals with it differently because we all have right. different personalities. So mm -hmm. I 
can give a few examples, but I think that book is really valuable to any musician, to any human, because it really is about how to achieve top performance and move from fear to confidence. And again, it's called That's Conquering so Life Stage Fright. Hannah, what do you do? That's so good. That's so good. Um, so <laughs> one thing when I was younger uh, and I would tell my dad, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. Oh, I have butterflies. I'm nervous. He actually very, very early on told me replace nervous with excited. He's like, you're not nervous. If you're prepared, if you've worked hard, if you're ready, he's like, you've got no reason to be nervous because you know what you're here to do and you've worked hard and efficiently to be able to perform at your best. So replace nervous with excited. And so I started to do that and it really put to the test this idea of mind over matter and the power that our mind and attitude have in everything that we do. And so it sounds easier said than done, just replace nervous with excited, but it really does work because then at that point, every time I felt those butterflies creep in, I would take a deep breath and say, Hannah, you're prepared for this. You're excited. You're going to get out there and you're going to kill it and literally encourage myself and build myself up and be my own cheerleader back there because no one else knows what I'm feeling other than me in those moments when you're backstage, backstage and you're ready, you're about to take the stage and get behind that kit. Only you really know what you're feeling inside. And so when you say, no, you know what? I'm not nervous. I don't have a reason to be because I'm prepared for this. I'm excited and I'm ready and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to kill it. When you do that, as soon as you sit down behind them drums, that that stage fright or those nerves, at least for me, they always just turned right into excitement and invigorating, exhilarating, all of the amazing adjectives for that adrenaline rush that you feel once you get on that stage. So it really helped me beforehand to change my train of thought from nervous to excited, from unknown to no, I know I'm gonna kill it. And your mind has such an, a powerful impact on your state of being. And that's what I love so much about talking with Mark because he believes this too. And that's why he talks about your attitude affects your behavior, which then affects the consequences of your life and the results that you see from your behavior. But it's all rooted in that philosophy that we talked about earlier. And so this is why your mind is so powerful and it's so important to prepare yourself that way as well, not just physically. Because if your posture or your attitude, your character isn't necessarily up to par with your skill set, you'll only go so far because your mind can actually take you out. And so and I, I, I want to add to that. Yes, please do. Physiologically, the chemistry in the body for fear and excitement are essentially the same thing. Wow. So if you think about the chemistry, like, like the sweaty hands, the uh, accelerated heart rate, the overactive yeah. mind. So you nailed it because the reality is the very same thing that you are afraid of you can be excited about, but only mm -hmm. if you're prepared. Because my book is called Conquering Life Stage Fright, Three Steps to Top Performance. The three yeah. steps are the three C's, clarity, capability, confidence. Have a yes. clear goal and then develop the capability. So if you've done the work, yeah, then you will get on stage. And even if you're nervous, it will usually go away because you, mm -hmm. the capability will always take over. The capability will supersede the nerves. So that's yes. very, very critical to remember that. If you mm -hmm. haven't done the work, you should be afraid. Right. You're you not prepared. <laughs> like we all have those dreams. I, I always these dreams all the time. I get on stage and I have no, no idea what I'm gonna yes. play and I'm freaked out. So everything mm -hmm. you're saying is actually based in science. Okay, we have a couple awesome. more questions. Great, by the way, Hannah, that was fantastic. Thank you, thank you. Um, one question uh, for both. What was the first song you ever learned to play on drums? Mine was Flashlight by Parliament. Oh, what a grooving song. Flashlight. Oh, yeah. Mine was <laughs> Sidewinder, the jazz standard. Um, I learned that, let's see, I was seven, seven, eight. I actually learned how to play marimba um, and other percussion instruments before I ever sat behind a kit. And the first time um, in this group, the, the fabulous leopard percussionist, when I got assigned drum set for a song, it was for Sidewinder and it was a jazz song. And uh, I remember Diane Downs, who is the leader of the group, the founder, she, I remember her telling me years later, I was so shocked 
how quickly you got that groove because it's swing, which isn't really a natural feel for most of us, especially young kids. Um, and then it's got a lot of syncopation uh, that happens. And so, uh, yeah, Sidewinder was my my first. Cool. What about you? I don't remember. I sat at a drum <laughs> set at five. I, I knew I, drums chose me. I didn't choose drums. I sat at a drum set at five years old and I could play a beat. I wasn't a Amazing. prodigy, but I just Amazing. knew what to do. Yeah. And, I, you know, so I, I remember just like, you know, playing along with the monkeys and the Beatles and then mm -hmm. um, uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears and then Three Dog Night. And then it just kind of and trying to play along with Buddy Rich, big band. Yes. But I don't remember yes. my first song. Sorry. Don't remember. No, Go that's on. all good. Any other questions? Great question, though. Love it. That was really cool. Mark, how did you get into session playing? Yeah, well, what's the secret, it. Mark? Um, you know, the greatest thing I ever did was to become a band leader of my band when I was in my early 20s. Because mm -hmm. I was a guy that was always playing too much. So mm -hmm. I could just play every chop I knew all the time. And I never understood anything differently. When I started to lead a band... And I started to produce an engineer because I got into the studio and I learned production and I take an engineering course. All of a sudden, drums became a part. They became a part of the of the whole. Yeah. So that was when I refined my skills and started to understand the vocabulary and what really mattered when it came to the song. Right. So I was, uh, my band, my original band moved up to Portland, Oregon. So from the age of 22 to 26, I did a lot of sessions in Portland and that was based on working out of that studio with my band and mm. realizing what it took to be a session player and understanding, you know, timing and really working on my meter and understanding sound and really how to tune and really how to mic. And so that mm -hmm. really nurtured my ability to be a session player. But it took my butt being kicked right. literally by me starting to play overcomplicated stuff, listening back and going, well, that doesn't work. Right. And when I'm in the driver's seat producing the band, I need to be really discerning about what really, really wraps up. Yeah. And there's just That's one so more good. question for Hannah, and then we can wrap it up. Just a Prince question for Hannah. What's your favorite deep cut Prince song? Mine is The Morning Papers. Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> it's so interesting because. I feel like a lot of the Purple Army know even more of this side of Prince than I do. Um, but a song that is not uh, released yet that I actually had the pleasure of recording was That Girl Thing. And uh, it was a slower um, ballad that hasn't been released, of course. But um, I think some people somehow have a bootleg. So if you've heard it. But um, I'm just kidding. But it was just a really um, beautiful ballad in his voice. Another one is Shade of Umber. Shades of Umber, Shade of Umber. Um, and um, that is another instrumental, but was super jazz, fusion-y, sort of odd time signatures. Really cool with the big band, with all the horns and everything. And it was really massive. We played that. I think we opened one of the Montro jazz festival shows with that cut. So if you guys are watching the YouTube videos of the Montro jazz shows, um, Shades of Umber is another really cool one that doesn't get a lot of hype, but it's just really technical and, and intricate. And we never did anything with click. So anytime there are these long breaks of silence, we're all just keeping that internal meter on our own and staying locked with each other because we never played with click even in the studio. There was never any metronome. So um yeah i guess that would shades of umber and that girl thing would be two of my favorites hannah i love you i love you too mark amazing time spent with you you're so articulate and uh thank audience you, everybody who's watching just thank you so much for being a part of this thank we're you so, guys i know we're so both we're honored and grateful yes. to be of service to everybody and to be here and gretch all i tell people is like play what you like I can't say play Gretsch because I play it, but I will say that Gretsch feels like home to me. Yes. Like you can't, yes. like certain food you like more than others, certain clothes you like more than others. Well, I sat down at a Gretsch kit and I knew, and I mm -hmm. endorsed all these other drums. And finally, when I started to endorse Gretsch, it was like, I'm home. Yeah. 
So, and you know what? I'll add to that too really quickly before we sign off here. Finding a good product is one thing, but finding a good product that also is just a reflection of the good people that create it and run the company oh, yeah. is another thing. And that really is what solidifies it for me. Of course, Gretsch, the drums are beautiful. Even the guitars are beautiful. I mean, everything that they manufacture from start to finish, the look, the sound, the versatility, the performance, it's always great. But what solidified it for me is the people. And, um, you know, Fred and Dinah, I love them dearly. Um, I've spent some really great intimate time with them. And they're just really great people. And then everyone else in the company that we've worked with really reflects that same vision, that same heart of servitude, like we've talked about so much today. And so the people are amazing as well. And so that's another reason why I love Gretsch with my whole heart is of course the amazing product but also the people that make it amazing absolutely i mean the people behind this podcast jules thomas yes love you guys and also fred and dinah fred and dinah are actually a couple of my best friends i mean i oh, love yes. it's such an amazing relationship so, so it awesome. really happy is, anniversary uh, to them i believe oh, right, today that's is right. their anniversary oh, yeah. happy anniversary well we love you all thank you so we much for listening y'all so rock um mwah. We're out of here. Love you guys. Bye, Mark. Thanks for hanging with me. Eat some Mexican food for Cinco de Mayo. Yes.